On 15 April 1945, almost exactly 75 years ago, the British Army came across the town of Bergen-Belsen. What at first looked like idyllic German countryside soon gave up its shameful secret. Good tilled earth, rich orchards and a carefree local population concealed unspeakable crimes. A concentration camp with some 60,000 starving and mortally ill people. Many were suffering from typhus, dysentery and starvation. Nearly 14,000 prisoners would die after the liberation. The contrast would shock the liberators. Belsen was not the first lager to be discovered. American troops had liberated Buchenwald only five days earlier, and the Soviets had already liberated Auschwitz on 27 January 1945 and Majdanek, the first operational camp to be discovered, on 22 July 1944. Evidence of the genocide was incontrovertible even before the camps were liberated. The Red Army uncovered sites of murder across their advance, in forests like Ponari, ravines like Babi Yar, and in abandoned death camps at Chelmno, Belzec and Sobibor, where the Nazis had attempted to erase their crimes. At Treblinka, Vasily Grossman wrote, the earth is throwing out crushed bones, teeth, clothes, papers, it does not want to keep its secrets. In spite of all this evidence, accounts by liberators all share shock at what they found. Soviet troops liberating Auschwitz could not at first understand why survivors did not celebrate their arrival with more joy or energy. Dr. Tadeusz Czowaniek wrote on 30 January 1945, In a brick barrack we found several female prisoners, two or more to a bunk, had time stopped for these women? Had nothing changed? They had difficulty moving. Their expressionless, mostly cold eyes aroused shame in us. Most liberators understood the scale, but could not quite countenance the psychological consequences of the persecution they uncovered. Evidently, neither rumour, nor written report, nor their own imagination could prepare them for the unprecedented Nazi effort not only to murder, but to dehumanize human beings. Nevertheless, both in the East and West, the liberators quickly understood that what had occurred in those places at that time and to those people would have universal and permanent consequences. And they quickly understood that in spite of its universal significance and the many targets of its persecution, Nazi ideology had singled out Europe's Jews for annihilation. In his essay, the Ukraine without Jews, written as early as autumn 1943, Vasily Grossman writes, There are no Jews in the Ukraine. Nowhere, in none of the cities, hundreds of towns or thousands of villages, will you see the black tear-filled eyes of little girls. You will not hear the pain voice of an old woman. You will not see the dark face of a hungry baby. All is silence. Everything is still. A whole people has been brutally murdered. That Jews had been the primary target of Nazi extermination policy was cl clear to British and American liberators also. Of the 18,000 women survivors they had found at Belsen, Derek Singleton wrote, They were a large part of the survivors of European Jewry, the sole survivors of families who had perished in the gas chambers of Birkenau and Treblinka. Yet no one wanted to know. Richard Dimbleby had to threaten his resignation to get the BBC to broadcast his now landmark report and then only in edited version, removing his mention of Jews. The same year, the American short film Death Mills took a, an ecumenical approach, describing the victims of Buchenwald as coming from all nations, all religious faith, all political beliefs. And in the Soviet Union, Stalinist policy would deny for decades the suffering of the Jews in the name of inclusivity. As historian Dan Stone puts it, the genocide of the Jews was subsumed into larger, familiar and more palatable narratives of national suffering during warfare. For those who survived, liberation was a bittersweet, long-awaited yet unexpected moment. For most survivors, the legacy of liberation was loss, and even as they celebrated freedom, they finally allowed themselves time to reflect on those who had perished, loved ones, whole families, whole communities. 
In the history of the Holocaust, the liberation was no more the end of despair than persecution had been the end of hope and resilience. Contrasting emotions continued to travel hand in hand within survivors for some long after liberation. Helped by the relief efforts of the liberators, but also facing continued animosity, surviving Jews set about the business of living and reconstructing. In displaced persons' camps they healed, they trained, they married and built new families. They reorganized politically and socially. They returned home or found new homes. And they set about honoring renewed commandments to mourn, to study and to teach, to write and to read, to understand and to remember. Even though these are painful tasks, as Elie Wiesel put it, real despair only sees us later as we emerged from the nightmare and began to search for meaning. Commemoration was, has been and is today part of that endless search. By remembering, we're keeping alive a link with people who went through the horrors and their immediate, urgent need to reflect is also ours.